Good morning. In today's headlines, President Biden is expected to announce the sale of more oil from the nation's strategic reserves today. Critics call it a bid to dampen fuel prices before midterms. Incumbent Senator Marco Rubio defends his positions in Tuesday's debate. Congressman Val Demings challenges on issues of voting rights, gun control and abortion. We have the highlights from the contentious debate. After high levels of radioactivity were found at a school outside St. Louis, parents are now furious and demanding action. Find out what they have to say about the terrifying discovery. The rapper Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, is handed a cease and desist notice by George Floyd's family. And a team of veterans and first responders have set out to cycle from Santa, Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara. We have their story on the road to recovery. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. It's Wednesday already. Today is October 19th. And you know that Strategic Petroleum Reserve, it was originally made to act as a backup in case of a severe energy supply shortage or disruption, like when OPEC cut off oil trade to the U.S. in 1973 after seeing its support for Israel. But now Biden's using it to reduce gas prices. Though some say the U.S. is less dependent on imports now, so the reserve isn't as important. Right. In any case, gas prices are rising now, and the Biden administration looks to sell more oil from the nation's emergency reserve this week. And that's according to a CNN report that referenced a senior administration official. Critics call it a bid to dampen fuel prices before next month's midterm elections. The president is expected to announce the sale today of an additional 15 million barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in December. This would fulfill the administration's announcement in March to release a historic 180 million barrels from the reserve over a six-month period. The Biden administration has also spoken with oil companies about selling an additional 26 million barrels to comply with a federally mandated sale. Biden has also made clear that he is prepared to authorize future releases in the coming months if global market conditions require it. Radioactive waste was found at Jana Elementary School outside of St. Louis. Furious parents raised questions at a school board meeting Tuesday night. The parents' concerns stem from a report showing radioactive lead at levels more than 22 times the expected amount. The radioactive material was found in the school's gym, kitchen, and schoolyard. The contamination stems from World War II-era nuclear weapons production. The contaminants entered nearby Coldwater Creek and then spread through the waterway to nearby homes, businesses, and now the school. And I asked you to review the information that we found terrifying, not because we were chicken littles calling for the sky to fall, but because the sky had fallen back in the 40s and no one seemed to care. I've been working 10 years to get a cleanup of radioactive waste in St. Louis. Um, I was a victim, am a victim, of exposure to the same waste. The school is closed as of Monday and most students will continue classes remotely. However, two preschool classes will continue to be taught in person at a different location. Yeah, and lead exposure can cause a host of problems like damage to the brain and nervous system and developmental issues. It's especially dangerous for young people. The CDC says there is no safe level of lead in the blood of children. It's expected the children will be moved to new schools before December. And candidates for the U.S. Senate debated in Florida yesterday. Incumbent Senator Marco Rubio is seeking a third six-year term. Congresswoman Val Demings challenged the senator on issues like voting rights, gun control and abortion. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on last night's debate. Demings came out swinging on Tuesday, accusing Rubio of being a serial liar willing to say anything in order to win. What we know is that the senator supports no exceptions. He can make his mouth say anything today. He's good at that, by the way. What day is it and what is Marco Rubio saying? I've said time and time again, and he knows it, that I support a woman's right to choose up to the time of viability. Rubio has expressed his personal opposition to abortion in all cases, but says he backs exceptions to restrictions because that's what the majority of people support and that's what can pass. I'm 100% pro-life, because I, not because I want to deny anyone their rights, but because I believe that innocent human life is worthy of the protection of our laws. That said, 
Every bill I've ever sponsored on abortion, every bill I've ever voted for has exceptions. Demings enters the final weeks of her campaign to unseat Rubio in a stronger position than many observers expected in the conservative-leaning state. She has raised close to $65 million, nearly double what Rubio has amassed. Recent polls show the former Orlando police chief within reach of Rubio, but still five percentage points behind him ahead of the November 8th midterm election. The two also clashed on the topics of gun control and voting rights. I'm not the person standing on the stage who supports suppressing the right to vote. Rubio defended his position on the issues, saying gun control laws proposed by Democrats would not have stopped shootings like the one at Parkland. Demings dug in on the issue of voting rights. We should protect voting rights for everyone, and we need a federal law to keep everybody accountable. Rubio took issue with her claims, asserting that it's never been easier to vote in Florida. We're talking about this. We're talking about, number one, when you go vote, you show an ID. I have been a Hispanic man my entire life. I'm a minority. I've never felt like producing an ID disadvantages my ability to vote. Everyone has an ID. You can't even check into a hotel. You can't buy Sudafed at Walgreens without an ID. Democrats currently hold slim majorities in the House of Representatives and the Senate. With Republicans favored to win a majority in the House, competitive races in states like Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona have increased Democrats' chances of defending the majority in the Senate. Demings is hoping to add Florida to that list. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. And another closely watched Senate race is taking place in Georgia. GOP nominee Herschel Walker is striving to unseat incumbent Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock. The Trump-endorsed former NFL star skipped Sunday's second debate at the Atlanta Press Club with Warnock. Walker's campaign team issued a statement Sunday explaining his absence. They called it a one-sided sham hosted by Warnock's liberal friends. They referenced a free beacon report that says some of the organizers donated to Warnock's campaign and his political allies. The statement also listed a multitude of questions Warnock had refused to answer directly in the first debate. Walker held a campaign rally in Atlanta yesterday. While there, he called out his opponent, saying Warnock is not taking responsibility as a leader. Here's more from Walker's speech yesterday. Senator Warnock said that uh, we were trying to hurt the name of Dr. King. Well, first of all, Dr. King has nothing to do with what's going on behind us right now. And I think it's wrong to have leaders to not retake responsibility to do what's right. You know, my campaign is about doing what's right for the people of Georgia. Now, since he's brought my name in, and also he brought one of the greatest black leaders ever name in because he don't want to take responsibility of what's happening with this economy, with the border, with all the inflation. Well, when you're a leader, be a leader. If neither candidate gets over 50% of the vote on November 8th, the race would be decided in a runoff election in December. And take this into account, though, there is a third name on the ballot as well. It's Libertarian Chase Oliver. While Oliver is not expected to win, he would prevent the, the he could, I should say, prevent the other candidates from getting a majority vote. And we're going over to Arizona now. Early voting is underway for the November midterms, and the state has several crucial races, including the race for governor and for U.S. Senator. Let's take a look. NTD's Molina Wise Cup went to early voting locations in Arizona to find out more about what voters there have to say about this year's midterm elections. What are some of the top issues they care most about this year? Abortion seems to be a big issue at current. Probably a big one would be Roe v. Wade, the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Some of the topics that are on my mind this year are probably just uh, reproductive care um, here in Arizona. It's a big ballot. It's a big issue on the ballot, um, as well as just gender affirming care for a lot of people here in the state. While abortion seems to be a big issue this year, other voters also talked about issues that are more relevant to Arizona as a border state. There's some big issues right now in Arizona, um, especially with drugs and immigration. The fentanyl problem in Phoenix is like the worst it's ever been. Border control is one of the biggest things here in Arizona. That's it's a major concern for us. Definitely the economy. Just uh, just watching inflation go the wrong way and. That's probably my, my biggest concern, and then after that would just be border security. Still, there are other priorities on different voters' minds. What's at stake is Medicare and uh, Medicaid and also Social Security. The top issue, I think, is the preservation of democracy. Yeah, that's a big one for me. 
Arizona's Senate election could determine which party controls the Senate. Democratic incumbent Mark Kelly is facing off against Trump-endorsed Republican Blake Masters. What do voters have to say about the two candidates and about how Trump's endorsement plays into it? Kelly just, I don't, I don't think he had a great debate. He sort of attacked Blake Masters, but he never really talked about what he wanted to do once he got into office. And so that was something I, I saw and I was like, that's kind of a problem. I don't think there's enough of the two candidates talking about the issues. I, I don't think Kelly's running on anything more than just he's not Blake Masters. And I think uh, Blake is getting destroyed by all sorts of negative ads too. And I don't think we're learning enough about what they're for. I don't put all my weight on anyone's endorsement. I've, I've tried to... Uh, gain the knowledge to vote the way I think is best, and uh, his endorsement means a little, but it's not everything. Early voting in Arizona began last Wednesday, October 12th, and will run until Friday, November 4th. Voters also have the choice to cast their ballots by mail. The trial comes to a close for a key source for the anti-Trump Steele dossier. He was acquitted on all counts by jurors in Virginia. Igor Danchenko, a Russian national, was acquitted on four counts of lying to the government after about 10 hours of deliberations. Danchenko was the primary source for the dossier compiled by ex-British spy Christopher Steele. The dossier included numerous now-refuted claims about former President Trump and was partially paid for by Democrats, including Hillary Clinton. Special counsel John Durham prosecuted the case. Danchenko was charged in November 2021 with five counts of lying to FBI agents during interviews about the dossier. One count related to Danchenko claiming he had not talked with Charles Dolan, a longtime Clinton associate, about any information that was included in the dossier. That charge was thrown out because the communication happened by email. The other four counts related to Sergey Millian a pro-Trump businessman. Danchenko told the FBI he thought he spoke to Millian over the phone in July 2016 and was planning to meet him in New York, but he provided no evidence in support of the claims. FBI agents testified that there was no record of a call between any numbers associated with the two and no mention of a call or plans to meet in a later email. The jury found Danchenko not guilty of lying about the call and plans. Coming up, dozens of law enforcement personnel are searching a large landfill for the missing Georgia toddler. And violence erupts as Chilean protesters clash with police. The clashes mark the third anniversary of protests against inequality in the country. Stay tuned for more after the short break. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth and so we continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Welcome back. The search for the missing Georgia toddler moved to a large landfill outside Savannah on Tuesday. Authorities said the investigators had evidence that led to this search area, but declined to say what it was. However, the police chief said it's believed that he was placed in a specific dumpster at a specific location, which was brought to the landfill by regular means of disposal. Police started the search for the 20-month-old Quentin Simon, when, Quentin Simon, when his mother reported his missing him missing on October 5th. After more than a week of searching the house and surrounding neighborhood, police believed the child is dead. The police also named the mother as the suspect, but she has not been arrested or charged. On to another topic, George Floyd's family has sent a cease and desist notice to Kanye West. The letter comes after West commented on Floyd's death during an interview on the Drink Champs podcast. The rapper suggested Floyd's death was caused by fentanyl in his system. 
West said in the interview the guy's knee wasn't even on his neck like that, referring to former police officer Derek Chauvin. The medical examiner who conducted Floyd's autopsy concluded Floyd's death was because of law enforcement neck compression. In the letter, lawyers for the family said they intend on filing a lawsuit. The notice demanded that the interview be taken down and for the rapper to refrain from making similar comments. The interview has been since taken down. New York City officials Tuesday presented a new tent shelter for illegal immigrants on Randall's Island in New York City. The aim is to provide as many as 1,000 new male arrivals with temporary housing. The city had to move the tents from their previous location at Orchard Beach because of flooding concerns. Nearly 20,000 illegal immigrants have come to the city since April. Many have been bused from Arizona and Texas. Apart from beds and a dining area, the complex provides phones, laundry machines, and recreation areas. Officials said the facility will open soon as a short-term solution for male illegal immigrants until they figure out their next step. The Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs for the Mayor's Office says New York has long needed a facility of this scale to house immigrants. We want to make sure that we're able to meet all their immediate needs, which as you saw include medical attention, include uh, rest, an area to rest, to take a shower, most importantly a way to connect to their loved ones and friends. We are trying to construct for people that we care about in the same way that we wanted that to happen for our family members and for those who are New Yorkers today. Texas Governor Greg Abbott has been behind many of the busloads of illegal immigrants sent to so-called sanctuary cities like New York. And Abbott tweeted yesterday that the White House urged El Paso officials not to declare a state of emergency over the city's illegal immigrant crisis. And violent clashes erupted in Chile's capital on Tuesday. It marks the third anniversary of widespread protests against inequality in 2019 that left more than 30 people dead. In the capital of Santiago, hooded protesters threw rocks at police, including in the area surrounding Plaza Baquedano, the epicenter of the 2019 riots. Police responded with gas and water cannons. The 2019 protests died down with an agreement to draft a new constitution and the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. The proposed constitution was overwhelmingly rejected by voters last month, forcing the government back to the drawing board as voters continue to demand change amid a struggling economy. In Ukraine, President Volodymyr Zelensky says nearly a third of Ukraine's power stations have been destroyed in just over a week, causing widespread blackouts across the country. Ukraine says it appears to be a deliberate campaign by Moscow to destroy electricity and water facilities before winter. Entities cost him an S has more. Smoke was seen on the Kiev skyline Tuesday morning. And explosions were heard in an area where there is a thermal power station. The mayor reported critical infrastructure was attacked, although it's not confirmed if the station was hit. Strikes have also left the northern city of Stormir without water and electricity supply. Explosions were also reported at an energy facility in the southeastern city of Dnipro and the northeastern city of Kharkiv, causing serious damage. President Zelensky has accused Russia of killing civilians with the air attacks. Moscow denies targeting civilians and using Iranian-made kamikaze drones, but says it's using high-precision weapons on military targets and energy infrastructure across Ukraine. Moscow recently appointed General Sergei Surovikin, nicknamed General Armageddon, as overall commander of what it calls its special operation. His appointment was followed by the biggest wave of missile strikes against Ukraine to date. Kost MNS, NTD News. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss has warned of tough times ahead as she addressed Parliament yesterday. She described tax U-turns as painful while speaking to fellow Conservative MPs. The Prime Minister defied calls for her resignation. Here's NTD's Kost Temenes with the details. British Prime Minister Liz Truss said she would continue trying to put the British economy on a stronger footing, despite the tax cut U-turns earlier this week. Truss on Monday said she was going too far and too fast, with her radical economic plan to snap Britain out of years of tepid growth. She said she is still committed to boosting growth through economic reforms. Calls for her resignation have been mounting just six weeks after she became Prime Minister. 
A new opinion poll shows little support for Truss among Conservative Party members, with more than half of those polls saying she should resign. A third wanted her predecessor, Boris Johnson, to return. Truss has said she will fight on and told her top ministers she wanted to level with the public that there were tough times ahead. Markets are still under strain even after her finance minister, Jeremy Hunt, tore up her plans on Monday. Truss says she accepts responsibility and is sorry for the mistakes that were made, describing the U-turn on her tax cuts as painful, while asserting she will lead Conservatives into the next election. It's unclear whether the apology will quell a growing rebellion in her Conservative party. Kost MNS, NTD News. And this next one is for the Netflix watchers out there. Netflix apparently has a plan in place to crack down on password sharing. Everybody brace yourselves for that. Starting next year, the streaming giant shared this and more during its earnings report Tuesday. Back in March, Netflix started testing extra member and profile transfer features in Chile, Costa Rica and Peru. These two features will be broadly implemented in 2023. The profile transfer feature allows users to transfer their current profiles to a new paid account. For those who want to continue to share their account with family and friends, the extra member option allows users to create sub-accounts under their main under their main account, but for an additional fee. No word on what that would fee would be, but during the testing it cost around $3 in Costa Rica. Coming up, a team of veterans and first responders have set out to travel from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara on bicycles. We have their journey to recovery after the break. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen. If you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. I love you! Welcome back. A team of veterans and first responders have set out to travel from Santa Barbara to, sorry, from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara, all by cycling. And today's David Lamb hears from the cyclists on what put them on this journey and who they're helping in the process. Veterans and first responders began their cycling journey on October 17th. Tuesday marks the second day of their five-day schedule from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara. The cyclists warm up with stretches to prepare for the 92-mile trek on day two. They're also repairing damaged gear from day one. It's amazing. I've been doing this for 12 years now and I've come to a lot of these and I think when I first started, you know, it was me looking up to guys and, you know, wow, that guy's doing this and now I've sort of transition to that role that now I come and I motivate people behind me because I'm in the front and they look at me doing it with my arms and they're like, I can't quit now, you know. It's a group of veterans. Um, we've all had injuries, whether they're invisible or visible, and we just, um, we get together and we not only heal physically, but we also heal mentally and spiritually because we're all working through something. We all have a story. The cycling challenge is organized by the nonprofit Project Hero to help those heal from injuries, including PTSD and stress. This trip is over 300 miles long, drawing in cyclists from across the nation. A lot of people don't know that veterans and first responders deal with a lot of mental health issues, and they're afraid to talk about it. This was something that, that got put into my lap and I found that it was letting the endorphins out you know I was getting uh, it's not taking as many anxiety pills I was you know lower I should say lowering my dosage on those and you know and, and amongst other things you know just physically you know improvements in my body and things like that 
Now this is an uphill part of Highway 1, posing an additional challenge for the riders. Earlier, one of the team members said they usually go about 25 miles per hour, giving them just enough time to take in the view. And we also have to work through those moments where we're like, oh, this hurts so bad. Can I do this? This is a, literally a mountain that we're climbing. We're going over Big Sur today, which is going to be insanely beautiful, but it's a lot. <laughs> um, but the, um, the reward is definitely worth it. And after riding, 82% of them have fewer PTSD triggers and 63% reduce or eliminate their medication. So it's a big program that really helps in the rehabilitation of um, wounded veterans. In order to make this journey possible, they need supplies which are transported by truck driven by a U.S. Marine veteran who survived leg injuries other veterans sharing what we know, what works, what don't work, um, and knowing that I'm not the only one that has to go through that. I had five heart attacks, three stents, and now I ride around 10, 20,000 miles a year on a bicycle. The veterans and first responders have a few more days to bike all the way down to Santa Barbara. And how are they going to do it? One day at a time, one pedal at a time. David Lamb, NCD News, California. What a great story. And you know, I just want to say thanks to all the first responders and veterans for your service. And this is such a great cause, not only helping them stay fit physically, but also mentally. Yeah, and I mean, it must be really nice to just spend time with, just come together and, you know, spend time with people that, you know, that can relate. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Well, we're wrapping up now for today. Don't, for, uh, don't forget, before you go, send us an email at goodmorning at entity.com if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.